scripture reading this morning is from uh, book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19, verses 19 through 34. John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. You'll follow along with me in your Bible as I read from God's holy and inspired word. This is John's testimony when the Lord from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? He did not refuse to answer, but he declared, I am not the Messiah. What then? They asked him, are you Elijah? I am not, he said. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then? They asked. We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? He said, I'm a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the, the Lord, just as Isaiah, the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water. John answered them, someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to, work, to untie. All this happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who has surpassed me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I watched the spirit ascending from the heaven like a dove and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the spirit ascending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that he is the son of God. Thank you, Ben. Today I'm gonna to talk about Jesus as the lamb of God. But it might surprise you to find out that I think understanding and trusting what that means is one of the hardest things for us as Christians. One of the hardest things. Can we really trust completely the love of God? I mean, from A to Z, from beginning to end, trust the love of God. That no matter what happens in our lives, we are secure in the love of God. Well, the testimony of my own heart is that I keep drifting into, well, maybe I haven't matched up yet. Maybe you never feel like you haven't matched up or that every time you match up, there's just a blank check and it's just quickly taken care of and there's no consequences after. That's naive as well. You can't get out of the fact that when we hurt someone, they walk away hurt. You can't get out of the fact that when you consume something, it has been consumed. You can't get out of the fact that when we, are, when we move, our ripples move out into eternity. And so we live our eternal life all the time. Our life is always eternal. Everything we say, even moving my hands now that moves the air, is changing the way things happen around. You can't escape personal responsibility. You can't be taken out of the fact that we and each of us together impact the world. So Jesus comes along and he's the Lamb of God. And he's telling us something and teaching us something that had not yet been understood for why would Jesus need to come if it had already been understood, right? If it was already being done the way it was supposed to be done, and some people thought it was, or that they were working for the right thing, then you wouldn't need the Messiah. Or if you had a Messiah, the Messiah would have been different than the one that actually showed up. The Christ that showed up was crucified because everyone that controlled the powers of the Roman Empire and everyone who controlled the powers of the religious authorities 
decided that that was not the version of God they wanted or were believing or accepting. So what do you do with this Jesus? You crucify him. We're on our way in Lent to the crucifixion. And if you watch the children's video today, they read the story of the temptations and Jesus saying no to Satan. And no, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm not going to do it your way. I'm not going to do it your way. I think that's a good way to proceed. Anytime you're clear that the devil's tempted, you say no. How are y'all doing on always knowing when it's the temptation that's coming along and when it's your own thinking that it's right? Notice he is the lamb of God. So this lamb is of God. This lamb is telling us about God. This lamb is telling us some things about God that were not yet believed because he got crucified. They were telling us some things that were true about God that some people did not believe were true. He got crucified. And I'm telling you, we consider, we continue to crucify Christ. We continue to insist that God work the way we want God to work and not like Jesus. We, we often refuse, and George is among those of us who refuse. To let God simply be God and love us and let our lives become in harmony with the way God loves. And Lord, we love the way we are loved. All right, we want to do that. I hear that all the time in my Christian life. You know, you, how should you love the way God loves you? Well, as insecure as I am, I don't know what that would be. What about the times when we understand and experience the love of God? The first thing I want to say is that God's love is eternal and available to us all. God's love is eternal, alpha and omega. All the way back to the beginning, God was God and God was love. And all the way, as far as you can see, eternity unfolds inside of God who is love. God's love is eternal and available to us all. In fact, in the scripture that Ben just read, John sees Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away, oh, what does it say? The sin of the world. It does not say the sins of the world. It says the sin. Of the world. In other words, this lamb is telling us that, that all the sin is taken care of. Past, present, future. The eternal God has taken care of all the sin, past, present, future. I'm just telling you, there's a lot of people who don't think that. What they think is that you have to come back over and over again and get re uh, gifted forgiveness from God. Like God's going to reject you and then accept you, reject you and then accept you, reject you and then accept you. I just want you to know, as much as I love my parents and my parents love me, I had a lot of that experience in my house. We're proud of you. We're not proud of you. We're glad you're our son. We're not so glad. Uh, maybe y'all had a home where that was never a question. That's good. I'm glad. I'm proud of, I'm proud of your parents, and I hope to have more, more people have that experience. But what happened was he took away the sin of the world. And according to Revelation 13, 8, the, the, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation. When was God loving everyone all the time? Eternity. All the time. When do we think God loves us? Well, if you would, I'm going to do a super oversimplified version of the Bible, of what the Bible tells us about that. Some traditions believe the Bible says one thing about God. And it's always the same no matter where you pick up the Bible. Our tradition says, no, that's, a, there's an old covenant, a new covenant. There's a bunch of different things we learned about God. And people were experiencing and saying things about God in the past that, that turned out not to be true when Jesus came along. He said, this wasn't true. Joshua says, God told me to kill everybody. Jesus comes along and says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. When they hit you on your right cheek, give them your left. What, that's not the same thing. Let's just review it really quick. People started, a, started in a garden. Everything was right, right? All pure and perfect communion and love with everybody and nature and each other. It's lovely. And then they left the garden. Y'all remember that? Left the garden. And what, what some people are going to say is that there was a sin that, that kicked everybody out instead of a sinner who left. You see, and so here's just what I want you to understand that the garden where everything was one, everything was lovely. We get out of the garden and then we start searching and we try to build a tower. You remember the tower? Let's build a tower and get to God. And God looks down and laughs and says, nope, that ain't going to be the way it works. And then, and then you have the flood and then you have the starting over with the covenant of Noah. 
And, and then Abraham comes along and there's this big jump. There's this big debate about all the gods and all the way God's uh, understood. And God's original name is Elohim, which is plural. And we understand that to be the Trinity, but it's but the truth is there people were really wrestling, wrestling with how many gods there were and what God was what, and who God, and how God. And then Abraham comes along and says there's one God. And not only is there one God, but that one God blesses all nations, all peoples, all ethnos, everyone. So Abraham's given a, a commission. You're going to go and represent the one God. You're going to leave Ur of the Chaldeans where you are, and you're going to go and you're going to make a, a, a religion, a people, a, a, a process, and a, and a community and a covenant with people who bless everyone. Everyone, God blesses everyone through you. Then you get Abraham, then you get Isaac, and then you get Jacob, and then there's 12 tribes of Jacob. Then it becomes tribes. Do y'all know how what happens when there's 12 kids and all their kids and all their grandkids? Does it get messy? Yes, it gets messy. And did it get messy? Yes, it got messy. And this these tribes, these 12 tribes are like, we're the, we're the favorites of God. And I think that was the mistake. Not that we are the children of God, absolutely, but we're the favorites. And they, they got in contention with their neighbors. Then they had the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jacob has his 12 sons, and you end up in a covenant. Then who gets to keep the covenant? If God has favorites, and the covenant is how you have favorites, you see how that's left the original vision of Abraham to bless everyone? Are y'all following? It's really a change. And then those 12 tribes enter into a promised land. And instead of being a blessing in the promised land, they become enemies with the people in the promised land. And then they want a king. They want to become a nation. What does the God, what does the Holy Spirit say to them? Don't have a king. They insist on a king. So God gives them a king. So then you not only end up with a temple where God's in a place, not everywhere, but God's in a place. So God didn't dwell within a people, but God's in a place, in a holy of holies, in a place made by human hands. And that's where you go to find God is in a place made by human hands on the top of a mountain, lording over people, killing people and enslaving people. And that's the way it was with kings. So the tribes became a kingdom. But in the midst of that, there was a, a plea from God. And the plea from God is, I'm going to bring you out of captivity and I'm going to give you guidance. I'm going to give you 10 commandments and I'm going to give you the Torah. And the beauty of the Torah is, but if you follow the Torah and you keep your heart right, you're going to know how to be my people. And so within, there's always this stream all the way through to the Christ and through the kings where people are saying, if we were to follow the law of God, the word of God, then we could be God's people and we could be what we were supposed to be, what we're made to be for our neighbor. And Christ comes along and says, let me just fulfill this for you. Let me be clear. And the clarity is that I came to fulfill the the promise of Abraham. And when Jesus says, I'm, I'm a child of Abraham, and uh, they say, we're children of Abraham. And, and Abraham, and Jesus says, I can make children of Abraham out of the rocks. I mean, just saying you're a child of Abraham is one problem. It's bearing fruit. How will you know that they're mine? By the fruit they bear. So Christ comes along and fulfills it. And when Jesus comes in and he's, at, he's seen as the Lamb of God, he is fulfilling the love of God. He's telling us what I think was always true, but because of how people are and all the, all the mix of doing the will of God and rebelling against the will of God that happens as we develop ourselves over history, we end up with Jesus coming and showing us the truth. And so Jesus comes and forgives us. Are we forgiven? The answer to these questions is, is yes. Are we forgiven? Yes, we are forgiven. And are we acceptable to God as we are in Christ? Yes, we are. My contention is that we have a hard time believing because we're still stuck with the baggage of the old covenants. We're still stuck with the baggage of our house where we grew up. We're still stuck with the baggage of the world where you're only valuable if you do certain things. We're stuck in that realm and we can't fully trust the Lamb of God. So let's ask the questions. When will we trust that God's love forgives? Forgives what we've done and what we've left undone. Have y'all done things you shouldn't have? I'm hoping the answer to this is yes. We're a humble group of people. And have you left undone things you know you were supposed to do? Yeah. Okay. Are you really forgiven? Well, I say, ask the question. 
When will we do it? Well, then read the Bible. How many lists of things you are supposed to do to satisfy God are in the Bible? Many. You've heard me say it a bunch of times, right? Ten commandments became 613 positive commands, negative prohibitions. Then there's prophets and, can't, and all kinds of commentary on all those things. Can you match up? Paul says in the New Testament, you can't match up to that. If you want to be clear based on that, you can't do it. You can't keep it all. Take a big, deep breath. Just understand that's not what you're going to do. You're not going to keep it all. Uh, so ask the Bible, how do you get acceptable? Accepted, then you're going to have a debate. I went to seminary, and I've been having debates with other Christians and pastors ever since. Exactly which one should you keep and which one should you not keep? It's a, it's a real serious question to many of us. Which ones do you do? Which ones do you not do? Then I ask the question. Um, then, or ask your people. Go ahead. Just get, take a big, deep breath. Go to people who know you and go, do you see anything in my life you think ought to be different? <laughs> do you see the problem? Ask your people. Do I, is there anything ought to be different? Should I, do I need forgiven for anything you could tell? I need forgiven for. Well, okay, then ask yourself. I don't know how y'all are, but that's the worst critic I've got is myself. See, I know me. I keep a journal. I don't want y'all to read my journal because I try to be honest in my journal. I write things down before I've thought twice about it. I write down the first thing I thought, and many times the first thing I think is not a good thing to think. I think it for reasons you shouldn't think things. Ask yourself about forgiveness. I would like to propose the answer. The answer, when will we trust God's love? When will we trust God's forgiveness? We will trust God's forgiveness when we trust that God holds nothing against us and when we cannot be outside of God's love. We will trust God's forgiveness when we know God holds nothing against us. He actually knew it was coming. That thing you did that you shouldn't have done? He actually knew you wouldn't do it. That thing you should have done you didn't do? He actually, he actually knew. He saw it coming. He made you. He knows everything about you. He saw it coming. And right then, he wants you to turn around and look at him in the face and look at the face of God. And the Lamb of God says, welcome. What, what's next? There's no, there's no distance. You thought you were distant because you turned away. You thought you were distant because you closed your eyes. You closed your ears. You didn't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. But when you have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, you're loved and forgiven all the time. Loved and forgiven. Loved and forgiven. Loved and forgiven all the time. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, neither height nor depth nor angels and principalities and things to pass and things to come. Nothing in all creation. And separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Where do we find the love of God? In Christ Jesus. Some people will say you don't have the love of God till you find it in Christ Jesus. I say you don't experience and share and love and, and 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 enter into your uh, this experience of the love of God till you're in Christ. You were loved before you got there. And you're loved when you wander out. When will we trust that God's love forgives? We will do that when we trust that we that God holds nothing against us and we can't be outside of God's love. Second is when will we trust that God's love accepts us as we are? Y'all ever look in the mirror and think, you're just not getting it. You talk to yourself, you just think you don't match up. Let's, let's do the Bible. Is everything about you as, as it should be with God? The Bible, again, which list do you want? Are you Hebrew? They seem to be God's favorite some of the time. I'm not a Hebrew. How is it that there's neither slave nor Jew, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female? How is that? God fully accepts us. That's what Christ said. Many times in the Bible, there are favorites. Jesus comes along and ends the days when we understand God as playing favorites. Or just ask your people. Again, not things I've done wrong, but you just, you know me. Was there anything you'd change about me? I mean, just like I am right now. I don't mean things I've done or not done. I mean, would you think, change anything about me? I don't know about y'all, but I get out of the shower and I go to shave and I'm standing there in front of the 
beer, and I think there should be less of that. That or wouldn't it be better if it was this way or that way? And then and then I think, well, why do I spend so much time thinking these thoughts when I should be thinking these thoughts? And how is it I have these basic instincts? Or ask your people or ask yourself. So when will we trust that we're accepted? Keep listening. It's when we understand the truth that God is dwell, we are dwelling within God the very moment we ask the question. Right then, God has brought us to that moment. All of eternity has conspired, if you want to think of it negatively, or all of eternity has brought together in this beautiful uh, consolidation of wonder and beauty who you are and who I am right now. And you say, well, there's things that aren't like they could be. No, right now, there's nothing else could be true that exactly who you are, exactly where you are, exactly what you've done, what you've left them. That's all that's left. And who does God love? You, right? When does God love you? Right now. Every right now is when God loves us. So when will, when will we trust that God accepts us? It's when we see Jesus and we think there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There's that Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. There's that one that tells us we're always loved. We're always accepted. Everything and everyone, just like we are now, just like we are now, exists within the life and the love of God. And you say, well, God's love didn't produce all that I think is needs forgiving, or God's love didn't produce all that isn't in harmony with the beauty and, and goodness of God. And I would, just, I would just like to say, it all happened within the life of God in you. And you were blind in some ways. You missed the mark. You were part of the sin in the world. <clears throat> and I'm glad. I just want to report the good news. The good news is that every one of us is loved right now. By God. Totally loved by God. Totally forgiven. And I think it's hard for us to believe. Because so many things in the ways we read scripture, in the ways we were raised with our people, in the luck with our people, in the ways we see ourselves, tell us we're not forgiven or we're not accepted. When will we claim and proclaim Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God? Well, remember in John chapter 1, before the passage of death, Jesus was the Word of God created before the foundation of the world. Everything that was created was created through him. He was in the world, according to verse 10, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Notice he didn't come to those who weren't his own, because everybody is his own. He came to those who were his own, and they didn't recognize him. There is a time before and after you know you're forgiven. There is a time before and after you know you're accepted. There's not a time before and after your love, forgiven, and accepted. That's very hard to, understand, to believe. It's very hard to believe. When will we proclaim Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God? It's when we let completely go of the old covenant with all of its conditions, and we enter into the new covenant of unconditional love. It's when we understand the truth that is contained within and and points to Jesus in the scriptures. It's when we take what our people have told us, and in every way they showed us love, let it affirm the truth of God. In every way they didn't show us love, let it be something they're wrestling with and could not match with the love of God. We have to forgive them and be forgive ourselves. And we have to keep telling ourselves over and over again that we are loved and accepted as we are. Now, you're going to quickly point out that God wants us to grow and heal and be different, right? right? I promise you, when any of us have decided to grow a garden, we work with the plants and seeds we got. Yeah, is that the way y'all do? You ever walk out there and say, well, that one didn't go like I wanted. Just, never mind. I'm not going to be a gardener. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Now, what, what do you do? Jesus had a, had a parable. There was this plant, and it wasn't producing fruit. 
and they were wanting to pull it up. And he said, no, don't pull it up. Let me dig around. It. Let me fertilize it. Give it some time. That's the way God does. Does God want us to heal and grow? Absolutely. Inside of the love of God. Not in order to get the love of God. It's not a threat. The love of God isn't something you are threatened until you earn it. It's something you have as you become and live and grow in harmony with it. So let us look fully on the Lamb of God and ask the Spirit to help us fully trust the love of God and the victory over sin found in Jesus Christ. So if you would, sit, sit still, just get comfortable for a second. I want to help us do a little something. Take a big deep breath and rest in the love of God. Breathe deep. Be reminded now in these moments, you are fully loved. You are forgiven. You are accepted. The Spirit of God is here. He fully embraces you. Any way you thought you understood, understood God differently, Please let the Holy Spirit help you let it go and know you're alone. Whether it's something you think you might have understood in Scripture or from your family of origin or from your own mind, even on this day, you would let go of it and be loved by God. That you would let Jesus be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Um, been probably five years ago now, I was sitting with a young guy named Michael and his mom, Denise, and uh, we were talking about the love of God, and we were, had actually met to work on another song, and I said, I've been working on this song, and uh, I've been, you know, was writing this song, and they helped me write it, because I had some different lyrics and stuff, and Michael was talking about how, well, it's hard to really trust the love of God because, you know, I, I believe my parents love me, but sometimes I think they don't. And then he said, yeah, I understand. I understand that too. And sometimes it's hard for me to believe God loves me because every time I see God, I see all of these things God is and the beauty of God, and I can never match up. And I think, well, since I can't match up, how can God love, love and I can't match up? And we just kept working on the song and it... the 
hope that calls us all. Come to the hope that calls us all. And dance. And dance. Come and dance with me. Let me dance with you, love and forgive Lord, uh, each of us has our own experience of your love. And we each struggle to fully trust your love. And I ask that your spirit would help us in this moment. To let this be one moment, one time, when we trust your love completely. And help us to recognize that when we trust your love completely, when there's no sin between us at all, when there's nothing left to be done except to follow you into the next reality, the next realization of your love and will for our lives. That if we have that moment, if we have this time, it's really the truth of all time. And it's only when we let the world, all of our misunderstandings and misgivings and illusions and struggles separate us Keep our eyes from seeing and our ears from hearing the truth of this very moment that you love us completely. Accept us and forgive us. And so I pray that this moment would be something that's true for us and that as we live our life this week, anytime we need to remember, we would remember. Anytime we need to return, we would return. And every time we need to tell someone this good news, you would let us in the ways we speak to them and and inter relate to them tell them the good news help them to experience the good news that you love them in the name of christ we pray amen <laughs>